at the beginning of Top Chef, all you're, you're thinking about was there had been no First Nation representation of food or chef on Top Chef Canada. That was my, that was my whole thinking. Get there, do that, change that. Then all of a sudden you're on a finale. All of a sudden people are looking up to you. Kids from Northern communities saying, you know, I didn't kill myself because I saw you on Top Chef and I saw that things are possible and that I chose to give life one more chance. And in the back of your mind, you feel like a fraud because I was still using, because I was still in active addiction. And people are looking at you like a leader. Look away. The Aboriginal food that uh, people have come to know was never us. Indigenous cuisine is not Indian tacos. It's not Bannock. It's from this land. Introduce it to the world. I kind of want a journey to reinvent Indigenous cuisine as we know it today. Osoyis is a reserve right on the U.S.-Canada border that has not only survived, but thrived. There he is that you walk by. You can buy cactus, scorpions, uh, rattlesnakes. So there is cactus here? Yes, quite a bit. Can you eat it? That I'm not too sure. Have you ever had cougar before? Never had cougar, no. Really? We might. Cougar, why not? It's the middle of winter here and my mission is to cook a meal I've never done before. Creating something new and innovative is really hard. And at the end of the day, yeah, I'm, I'm scared of my own success. It's that one ugly monster that, that's still there. But food is that one ugly thing too that, that has never let me go. So it's that constant back and forth. The Osoyoos Indian Band are the wealthiest tribe in Canada. They've created a business empire. They control 32,000 acres of soil-rich vineyards and luxury golf courses. It's the Hollywood of Reses, in my opinion, and a big part of that is because of its leadership. Did you watch the one Born Again Savage? Uh, I didn't see that one, no. I'm a born again savage. <laughs> well, join the club. <laughs> That's one of the best quotes I ever heard yeah. one of our leaders say. Over the last 30 years, Chief Clarence Louie turned this place from poverty to prosperity. And when you meet the chief, you eat at the restaurant of his choice. Coming here at first glance is that it, it's, it's, Hollywood, it's a Hollywood res. It's not your typical res. <laughs> Even compared to... I like the, that, Hollywood the, res, man. More, I'm, I'm, uh, gonna, I'm gonna use that. I've never <laughs> heard of that before. See, that's, that's part of my agenda as a, a, first, a modern, a contemporary indigenous chef is going beyond, I guess, what we've always known as indigenous cuisine. Factual history of North America, U.S. and Canada, when the Europeans arrived here, who fed them? The Indians. And what did they eat? They ate traditional they, foods. They exactly. The native people were the first chefs of every territory. Mm -hmm. The OIB, who are you and what, what are you guys all about here? We've always been pro-business. We're a pro-business community. And that's why we have uh, more band-owned businesses on, on a per capita basis than any band in the country. Mm -hmm. Do you think with the kind of main influence being the business side of things, do you think that maybe culture took a hit? Whatever the, ec the economy is in your traditional territory off the res, that's what you got to get involved in. You have more of a chance losing your heritage and culture in poverty yeah. than you do when your people are actively involved in the economy. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to lose it more when you're, when you're on welfare and you're barely eking out in existence. You know, the Aboriginal food that uh, people have come to know was never us. Uh, the, the flour, the sugar, okay, the only thing that it represents about us is survival. 
Is this sage here? Yeah. This is where you'll find rattlesnakes too. No one knows these hills better than Taylor Baptiste. Why Haskell Haldi Pisnak Seal and Shai Squisquak Trea can tell Inkimit? Her family has been hunting on these lands for generations, and this is her backyard. Taylor grew up hunting and eating traditional foods like cougar and prickly pear cactus. In midwinter, uh, if they had no food, they could dig through the snow and find this. And then they would burn off all of the barbs, and then you could boil or like cook the flesh. People wouldn't eat this just on the regular, like this was what they would eat in times of starvation. An elder in the making, she's fighting to keep her language from disappearing. So your language is what? In Silchen. How many people speak it, you know, that, that you're aware of? Um, probably less than 50 fluent. Really, yeah? Probably about two to 300 semi-fluent but um, where it's getting lost is the generation of parents that we have right now, a lot of them don't speak it because their parents went to residential schools, so they, yeah. they didn't speak it. Um, but so we're really just focusing on our children right now to make sure that they have it. My dad did go to residential school and he was taken away at a, at a really young age. Being a father of three, having my kids taken away like that, there's no way. There's no way I could could do that. But f from that generation, he was not able to be a father. So if, if I'm going to cook to reconcile, then I have to make it personal, you know? And, it, and it's him that I think about. That's my inspiration right there. I've been around kitchens all my life and traveled around the country teaching young chefs. For me, cooking is all about risk and some experimentation. Rediscovering my people's traditions and reinterpreting them for a whole new generation. Siobhan Dekovic is a rising star in the Okanagan food scene. But like so many of us, she didn't grow up eating traditional indigenous food. Which leads us to the question, what is indigenous food anyways? I feel like it's almost like one of those like stereotypes almost. People can make a mean banner, like don't get me wrong. Like if you look at like Indian cuisine, it's like, oh, it's only just curries and non bread. Being able to break through that, it's one of those things where it's like you can show people this is like, you know, who we are, this is what we can do. But it's just great to like, you know, get the voice heard. Every culture in the world has some sort of a bread that they've created. And when the Scottish people came to North America, they showed the First Nations people how to turn wheat into flour. And the Scottish people's bread at that time was called Bannock. So they called it Bannock, and the First Nations people adopted that name. It's just basic flour, water, pinch of salt, pinch of baking powder, and that's pretty much it. But that doesn't represent who we are, and it doesn't define us. Cinnamon bannock bites, ogopogo bannock, score bannock, and fried bannock. You can do like bannock dumplings if you want. You know, there's so many, there's so many options. Bannock represents dinner. It's and bringing people together. And so when you talk about food in any culture, your eyes light up, and it means that we're going to get together and we're going to share stories and we're going to break bread, right? It's just called bannock. Bannock is probably one of the biggest survival tools that we have. It's bad for us. We're borderline diabetic and obese, but we still eat it because we can't let it go. It's like a drug. And that's the whole paradigm of the whole thing. Spotted Lake gets its name from the mineral rich deposits that make up this natural phenomenon. There are said to be one deposit for each day of the year. It's a sacred place of healing and a perfect location to share stories, ceremony, and of course, food with a few of the local elders. Our people have come for thousands of years to come to this sacred area for healing. Yeah, like when I first came here, I was told about the, the healing properties of this and a big part of my cooking philosophy is, is cooking from the land. I kind of want a journey to 
reinvent indigenous cuisine as we know yeah, it today. I think, I think it's a great idea that you guys are finally reinventing our way of cooking that's been here for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say reinventing. I think it's uh, rediscovering. But um, to connect back to the land, you really have to know your language, your culture. And a lot of that was taken away back uh, when the government committed genocide against our people. If you spoke your language, of course you were beaten, you were whipped, you were punished for being who we are. People older, younger, went to residential school, came back and didn't know how to be parents. We are resilient people. They tried to kill us, but they never did. It's a symbol of how we survived this, this long. We need to go back to that if we're gonna keep thriving and it's timeless. And that's what I hope to capture on a plate, you know. The bubbling happening on that, that's a good sign that it's starting to cook in the inside. Cabbage doesn't get enough love, you know. It, it's, it's peasant food. You can try the outside, but what you're left with is this like milky, tender, almost sour, almost sweet cabbage that's remarkable. I wanted to try some of your, it's a chefala, little piece of your bread. Yeah, totally. I can grab it for you. There you go. Sure. Now I got, I got a piece. Yeah. Yeah. What's the bread made out of? Enriched white flour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's in your salad. <laughs> There's a little piece. Yeah. Should I get oh, back? Should I get back? <laughs> <laughs> this is a Kukuli, a traditional underground winter home. It's a perfect place to reconnect and cook our cougar. It's exciting to cook with ingredients I've never used before. And we're very lucky to have this chance. All right, so what did you need on there? Okay, so let's uh, pull that cougar apart and just maybe see what anything's got to, see if you can identify where that's from on the, on the animal. This? Yeah. Oh, awesome, yeah. That looks like... Would it be like... Like maybe the lion? In case yeah. you're wondering, the animal was taken down because I had gotten too close to a local farmer's land. So I'm excited like to see like how the taste is and everything. I don't even know what to expect, like if it tastes gamey. Um, apparently I've heard it tastes like pork, so I'm interested to see how it's gonna come all together at the end. The OIB people traditionally lived off deer, moose, bear, and salmon. But during those long winter months, eating cougar and cactus was the last resort. Putting into this, so I don't know. It's it's something brand new I've never done, so I'm just kind of, you know, this is a test kitchen. Going with know, it? So All right. right. That's what my whole career has been. I've known more failure than I've known success. There's been a few times where I, I get to a point where like, I, I've never cooked, you know, what I'm about to cook ever before. And that's honestly where I just kind of let things go. That happened the first time I cooked well. I've, and since then, I've cooked it a few different ways. Cougar was something, fortunately and unfortunately, that they had to eat, you know, and um, through the process of colonization and this idea and that idea, what's right or wrong, um, we still ate it. <laughs> um, where is the cacti? So it's literally cactus. Those are edible? Yeah. Oh, so this right. is what the uh, soy we sweet. eat midwinter. Okay. When everything was kind of gone, and this would be like a last resort, and we're gonna throw this in the fire. Even like when I was in active addiction, I was always looking for belonging. I was always looking for my place in this world, whether it be within a family unit or um, within, you know, the kitchen but I found that now that I'm in recovery like I found that belonging and kind of anywhere I am now. 
my personality and my food are one and the same. Um, very rough, very raw, very edgy, and I try to tap into that that energy as a as a chef. Okay, I'm gonna try this. Don't do this at home. It's slimy, <laughs> but it really has no Not flavor, flavor profile. Okay. Let's, let's just singe the hell out of them, right. um, and then we can still keep the outside. Okay. Okay. Why I like cooking with live fire so much is because it actually has, I, I, I feel kind of like its own personality. I think it's, it is a spirit. It's living, and I think you have to be connected to it. Because it has such low, or yeah, low, low fat content, you really want an aggressive, aggressive heat on it. I'm gonna treat it almost like a uh, wild, like wild boar. The primal aspect of uh, cooking with fire, I think it's, it's actually, it's very sexy. <laughs> I don't know, it's very expressive too, and it's very unpredictable. What is that? Uh, Cougar. Oh, sweet. Smell it. That just smells really good. That does, eh? I'm excited for this. <laughs> this actually smells pretty good. <laughs> Intuition for me is the one thing I learned to listen to. So cooking is the one thing that we, we utilize all six of our senses. Yeah, try that out. Yeah. That is really good. <laughs> it's kind of porky. Never didn't expect it to be like that. I think the the relationship between survival and intuition, they're both interconnected. What you're trying to do is do what's right, you know, no matter what. So we're gonna make the cactus cactus chimchurri. Let's call it a cactus chimchurri. Yeah, let's cook some of these off a little bit more. And intuition is the one thing that I've realized that will never steer you wrong. So the risotto is going to be the bitter roots, the mushrooms, and the rice. Taylor and her family are here. What exactly is like a bitter root? I've learned so much from them over the past few days, and it's a humbling experience to cook out here as our ancestors once did. So you dig it. So this okay. is the. And so this comes out of the ground, right? But it's got a red casing over it, okay. and while it's fresh, you just slide it off. Oh. So and that's what's white underneath. So is this the the four food the four food chiefs? The creation story for the Okanagan people is called the Four Food Chiefs. It's a story about sacrifice, survival, and gratitude. A deep reminder of our people's pride and respect for the land. In the world before this world, before there were any people here, the people that were here in this land walking around and talking just like us were the plant and animal people. The four food chiefs were Speetlum, Bitterroot, Sia, Saskatoonberry, Intiktik, Salmon, and Skimkeese, Black Bear. And so Chief Bear sat and thought for a long time. And then finally he said, I will lay down my life so that the people to be can use my body. They can use my skin and my fur for clothing. They can use my meat and flesh for food. And they can use my bones for tools. So that's why we have a lot of ceremonies and songs that come along for when we're harvesting these four food chiefs. Because it's important to remember that they lay down their lives for us. And it's important to live in harmony with the land. I can probably assure you this dish has never been done before. They're all survival ingredients that we would have, like say around midwinter and yeah, it's, it's modern indigenous cuisine. Becoming a chef wasn't that hard. I experienced, I experienced every other kind of obstacle every other chef experienced. But being an indigenous chef, that's when things kind of changed. We're cultural ambassadors now. 
We're fire carriers. We're knowledge keepers. This is a role I never anticipated, but it's something that you're given. That's, that's the ultimate goal of modern indigenous cuisine is not to lose the integrity of what you're going for, but make something different.